to welcome everybody joining this event all over Europe, maybe also all over the world. It's, it is for us a new challenge, but now we are getting a little bit used during the COVID crisis. But it's also a chance that more people can join the webinar, which I think it's also quite nice for everybody because you have any time in the next week to look on the webinar if you have to go or something happened. Furthermore, I hope we will have an enjoying webinar and see interesting cases and I hope we can give you some hints for your work and um, some tips. Thank you very much. I give over now to Pierre um, who would like to welcome you too. Thank you Anini and uh, good afternoon uh, everybody. Uh, I would like to introduce all the speakers uh, and Professor Anneli Brenberg from Graz. Uh, Following by uh, Tony Andreaccio from Milano, the president, the current president of EPOS, then uh, Melida Winbrook from uh, Amsterdam, and Pierre Lascon, the past president of EPOS uh, from uh, Geneva or France or Nancy. I am uh, very happy to introduce uh, Scott Ofinger from Autopediatrics. Autopediatrics, as you know, is a very great support for the webinar. And uh, we have the chance to have a short, brief uh, word from uh, Scott. Scott. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Weinberg, Journeau, the distinguished faculty and the EPOS members, and especially also those people who work to organize the webinar. These are very difficult to put together, and so far it's worked very well. My name is Scott Hoffinger, and I'm the new medical director for orthopediatrics. I took over for Peter Armstrong, who many of you may, may know, and he's now working with the Educational Foundation. While there's been a change in this position, there's no change to orthopediatric commitment to partnering with us orthopedic surgeons to help us take care of our patients. And we're proud to be able to sponsor efforts such as this webinar. After my career as a busy pediatric orthopedist for 30 years, I spent a year in London, and I just joined orthopediatrics because of their exclusive commitment to pediatric patients and to help us do what we need to do. As a large part of my career involved trauma and reconstruction, this trauma webinar looks particularly informative. This is a critical topic, and I'm very interested in, uh, in hearing this webinar. Congratulations to the organizers, and again, it's a pleasure for orthopediatrics truly to support this webinar, and we look forward to meeting in person in better times. Thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, Scott. Uh, so we are moving to the first speaker. The first speaker is Hannah Lievenberg uh, about uh, physis uh, injuries and uh, physiopathology of uh, after injuries. Hannah I'm mute. Sorry, I was mute. I hope everybody can see my screen. Yes? Yes. Okay. So what's about the pathophysiology after injury? If you're looking on the physis, we know we have different zones. We have the reserve zone, we have the polyvative zone, which is the column of chondrocytes, we have the resorption zone with hypertrophic chondrocytes and the zone of primary ossification. If you are going a little bit deeper, we know we know that the resting zones, the, stellar, the cells are not, not working. Oh, how can I get this away? I can't, okay. So there's the location of germinal, uh, germinal matrix, inactive chondrocytes in the reserve zone, serves as the storage area for lipids, proteins, glucans for growth and matrix production. If you are looking to the polyphyl zone, it's the active chondroplast, the chondroplast um, create extracellular matrix. The proliferative zone is the most important one for longitudinal growth. If we then go further to the hypertrophic zone, we have more organized chondroblast, decreased production of ECM, and the zone is subdivided in different zones. The zone of professional degeneration, the zone of professional calcification, this is the weakest zone and most of the fractures are going through this zone, which is quite good because it's not touching any resting zone or proliferative zone. 
zone of calcification is the next where the blood supply is coming and the ossification took part. If we go on, we have to know that we have uh, some other um, 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 issues. That's the groove of Ranvir. This is important because not only because there is a different kind of um, cells alignment, they are not structures like in the crow's blade, but we have their osteoblast, fibroblast, and chondroblast. And it's it's um, the uh, growth of Rania is responsible for peripheral growth of the crow's blade, and on the same side, on the same area, the blood supply is running. If you are looking further on, we have the ring of Lacroix, which makes the physis more stable, fibrous connected metaphysis, and epiphyseal periosteum. If you go on, we have to say that we have two main sub, uh, blood supplies at the crow's place. And in the injection study, they could show that the vessels from the epiphysis end at the layer of the resting cells. And the second one is coming from the vessels from the metaphysis, which end at the layer of entiontral ossification. Especially the zone of Ranvir and the um, blood supply of the epiphysis, you have to respect when you go and operate. As you see, here is a case where one key wire, um, I can't show you with my, um, with my mouse, where one key wire really attached at the border of the physis at the Ranvir zone, and this is very dangerous. If you have to cross the physis, trying to be in the middle and, and not to be peripheral, to damage um, the blood supply, and as you see, you see a cross arrest, and cross arrest also can be after infection, burns, or tumors. If we go on, we have to see, uh, we, we have to talk about the Salter Harris classification. It's the pathophysiology after injury, means that Salter Harris 1 type fractures are always going to the zone of hypertrophic cells, which is best for, for not damage the uh, epiphysis. It's not that you can't damage, but it's more or less because you don't touch the resting layer, that it's less usual that you have gross disturbances. And the second one is Salter Harris 2. You are familiar with this. This is the same. The periosteum remains intact on the metaphysical side of the fragment and provides stability once the fracture has been reduced. Again, gross disturbance are unusual because the resting layer is intact. But nevertheless, you have a certain amount of patients who nevertheless uh, develop this and this is because also a fracture can destroy the blood supply and then you have the pattern of uh, coast disturbances. We go forward to the Salter Harris 3 lesion as you know the fracture is intraarticular and this means that it, the fracture goes through the epiphysis and through the physis there is a higher risk to growth rest and any displacement in the joint surface has to be corrected. And if we then go to the type Salter Harris 4, we know that this is crossing the resting layer. And as it is a joint fracture, it, you need to prevent articular incongruity, but also you can have an osseous bridging across the physis. I have some cases, I present you some cases. As you see here, it is a fracture which innately was treated. Uh, conservatively, but you see that the physis is connected to the metaphysis. This means a bar and this will follow in a cross arrest, so this fracture has not been reduced accurately. We go uh, we, in this time period, we remove the bar and then we interpose, uh, interpose it some fat tissue. If you go on here, you see the, the boy and his growing by time. But on the other side, you also, as I mentioned, you can destroy this or you can produce this with, uh, with um, um, osteosynthesis. As you see here, also the epiphysis is connected to the metaphysis and makes um, problems later on. As you also see here, if you have an X-ray where you see that the physis makes a bow and the epiphysis is not near to the metaphysis, there is an incorrect reposition and you have to avoid this. This is for sure a partial, partial cross arrest. What kind of phenomena we have, what 
overgrowth pathology we have, we could have an overgrowth, which could be partial. It's not so seen so often, but you can have it on the condyle radius. <coughs> and on the other side, more of the overgrowth on the uh, lower extremity is because of a complete closure. Then you have leg length di discrepancy. If you go on, if you have a growth rest, partial growth rest is quite common, then you have an axial misalignment, an axis deviation. If it's complete, you have a shorter leg. Here also some uh, a picture because spontaneous cor correction means, as we have said, that you have can that you have can that you can have an overgrowth. This all, always can also be induced by fracture treatment. And in the 17th, we tried to shorten fractures in the femur, but at the end, as after every fracture, the physis is stimulated, we see an overgrowth. So this doesn't help to prevent overgrowth. So we know the relationship of healing to physical stimulation. Physical stimulation continues throughout fracture healing and is as long as the remodeling takes part. The prolonged healing phase results in prolonged stimulation. And we have also to take in account that, that rigid fixation versus relatively stability makes difference in healing and also in overgrowth. Um, and anatomic reduction versus displacement, which needs several um, re-reduction, also um, continue to stimulate the physis, which means you can have a leg length discrepancy. Here you see you can have a central cross arrest, as seen on the left um, side of this slice, but you also can have a partial cross arrest. And here you see also the Harris cross line, and you see the shifting of this bone to a, a, a varus de deformity. Here we have another case, and this is what I mentioned before. It's not sure that you can't have any cross disturbance if you just reduce or just cast a fracture. Here we have a Salter Harris 1 lesion and at the end this, this girl also developed a cross arrest. So be caution by reduction or manipulation because all of this also can um, make some cross arrest or disturbance of crows. Here's another um, case. This is a um, ex excuse me, this is a an, an, an six-year-old girl was hit by a heavy iron door we treat it conservatively, but she developed a central cross arrest. And as you see, she got a length length discrepancy in the uh, left up, um, lower extremity. Here you see the cases again. The traumatic lesion of the, fif of the physis is something we want to investigate because we want to understand how bar lesion or, or bony bars how they developed and also trying to, to find new attempts to treat such um, diseases. I'm not talking about how you treat it, I'm just talking a little bit what happened. Normally we have a hypervascularity circa from th th day three and if we are looking on an MRI, the bar formation is not as fast as the fracture healing. It took at least 30 days and if you want to detect it, um, you have to be um, clear when you, when you want to do an MRI. Here what happens, we have an inflammatory phase where cells in infiltrate the injured area. Then we have mesenchymine steam cells which also penetrate into the hole or in the lesion from the surrounding marrow compartments and then we have the evidence of angiogenesis and formation of mineralized tissue which is our problem that a bar is always bony. It's a bony procedure and the main chance if you detect it or if you have a lesion of, of the physis, could we do anything to de de avoid this? Uh, up to now we have no chance. And you see here, if you have a lesion, always we get a bony bar. Sometimes we will, I think my colleagues will talk later on, it's depending on the size that also spontaneously bone bridges can go away. And an important message is also, if you have a lesion, spontaneous bar, uh, bars could only, always develop, even if you did not um, keywire or do something, 
often they remove spontaneous by itself, but for certain thickness or areas, we will come to this, you have to be caution and then maybe you have to decide when you treat it. What is the main problem in the research area? It is still not clear why an osteogenic differentiation took part. It is said that it's the hypothesis is that it's um, the angiogenesis which come into this part and trigger the bony bar. But till now, we would like to know a little more about this. That's why I do a lot of investigation in this, because if we understand, then we can also maybe have a treatment for it. This is what I want to say. If we are looking on the pathophysiological logic, pathophysiology after injuries, we can have a surgical approach. We will hear a lot in this webinar, but newer investigation also trying to find medical treatment, which is ambitious, because also if you give some um, PowerGF or something like this, then you always have the problem that you on the same time prevent other biases to grow. So this is a very difficult attempt, so you have to locate it um, get the medication there and this will be seen in the future if we are successful or not. So I have to say thank you very much that you have talked to my, uh, that you have listened to my talk. I would like to, excuse me, because now I have a challenge because I could not click my, mm, maybe like this sorry because i'm i'm not able to have the mouse to close my my presentation so now i will um, take the chance to introduce tonio or i also have to say the president of the epos community he will talk now about risk factors and kinds of factors and how to prevent them I, it will be great to have him on board and thank you very much to take your time to, to do this webinar with us and um, thanks for, for, for your presentation. Professor Andreacchi, are you muted? Okay, thank you, Anneli. Thank you to everybody. I hope uh, you can uh, you can see my share screening. It's okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I have to try to proceed. Okay. Uh, so the incidence of fracture involving the physis is nearly three to for uh, one thousand children. And the physical injuries is 18% of all fractures in children involve the growth plate. And these fractures are more common in boys and uh, occur more frequently in upper extremities. So what physics uh, uh, are the most commonly involved uh, and, uh, and never just serious? There is uh, something uh, uh, we talk about the possibility to have a phalanges that are more involved. Than the others, and then you can see here the uh, the percentage. And the most severe, like the distal femur, is even fortunately the less involved uh, physical fracture of the distal femur. I mean, so uh, sequelae up of the 15% of physical fracture determine grow arrest requiring tri treatment. And so we have to talk about the treatment question: Why some physical fractures lead more breach? Which fractures are most, most at risk and how to prevent bone breach? So the first one is why some physical fractures lead bone breach. And uh, uh, when the first uh, issue is severity of injury. So displacement, comminution, loss of segment, and germinal or proliferative zone are more involved. So type of fracture is a longitudinal fracture or transphysial uh, vascularity, I mean, or transverse fracture involving germinal and, prol and proliferative zones are, uh, can load a different uh, pattern. And the end, but maybe the most easy, uh, recognizable, recognizable uh, pattern is the anatomic side. So the distal uh, radio is most linear uh, instead of the distal femur and the distal tibia, which are 
undulated. So uh, the growth potential, of course, is very important. So younger kids are more uh, prone to have uh, uh, more severe sequelae because there is more uh, growth uh, potential uh, in, in front of their life. The second question is which fractures are more at risk? So uh, just only to recall for the femur and lower extremities, I mean the femur, the proximal femur, uh, the growth arrest typically due to ischemia is not for the trauma in the most of the cases. And the distal femur is a typical central longitudinal growth dis disturbance. On the other side for the tibia, the proximal tibia is a typical central longitudinal growth disturbance and if at the tibial tubercle, we can load a record bottom sequelae. And for the distal tibia, the most often anteromedial and camps bump uh, can have a, a virus deformity sequelae. So what is unique about the physis of the distal femur? So there are uh, several studies of have uh, um, focused on the mammillary process, which share the forces here affecting the reproducing cells. And the explanation for this predilection probably relates to a central physial undulation, which is the region of the earliest the physiologic closure of the distal femoral physis and the most common site of premature bridge formation. So 60% of the distal femoral bone bridge involves the central physial undulation. And uh, almost in the same way for the distal tibia, similarly 60% of this this the t, uh, distal tibial bridge involves the anteromedial quadrants and the physis with encompasses with the undulation known as camps bump. So the normal distal tibial physis closure begins at this point. Uh, regarding the upper extremity, the distal humerus and so the cubitus virus common angular deformity after supercondylar fracture are not typically due to the bridge formation but secondary to malunion. And for the distal radius, low rate of bridge formation and high incidence of physical injuries when occurs led to ulnocarp ulnocarpal abutment. So, for example, there's a fracture through the uniplanar, relatively smooth growth plate, and the distal radius are common but rarely cause growth arrest. This is a, a, a case. And uh, what's the base pathology of the physis arrest? So the bridge, the physial bar, is a cortical because the tension forces from adjacent function in physis, which stimulates the development of the dense cortical bone. And so we can uh, recognize the two main mechanisms. One, the first one is direct physical injury, and uh, which uh, provokes communication of the epiphyseal and metaphyseal vessel, and then can have osteoprogenitor cells deposit bone along the vessels. The second one is the disruption of the epiphyseal vessel that supply germinative and proliferative zone. Uh, regarding the third question, how to prevent the bone breach? So it's impossible to prevent. So the surgeon's liability may increase the risk due to or treatment, otherwise do no treatment and the treatment can be adequate, inadequate or there is a lack of reconnection of the physical fracture. So the bone breach is due to the physical arrest independently from the treatment, as uh, such as in the Solteraris type 5. You, you can find here uh, one of my cases and uh, after three years you can recognize this, this pattern. And uh, this is a, a, another patient who had a, a distal fra uh, fracture of the radius and it was immobilized for, for that. But you can find after two years, there was probably a, a, a type five of the distal hole, the physis of the hole. So even in this case, when the, the treatment was correct and properly treated, but the, the, the bill was presented after two years. So, uh, Bone breach is due to surgeon's responsibility due to the treatment, not proper side of the, of the Kirchner wires. This is a, a case when five years later. And uh, you can find here in the MRI more uh, accurately the presence of the bone breach. 
or that is due to the surgeon's responsibility due to no treatment. In this case, was uh, treated uh, conservatively and uh, probably is in, in a proper way, so the, it was inadequate because the gap was uh, uh, over two millimeters and uh, this is not the properly corrected uh, uh, treatment. Or the lack of recognition of the physical physis. In this case, it was a uh, uh, this fracture was not uh, uh, properly recognized because it was very tiny uh, and thin, the, the, the linear fractures, and that's one of the, of the problem with the kids, the fracture in the, in the kids. So, uh, advice on, on how to stay out of trouble, as Mark Twain told. And uh, the first one, I risk. So, attempts to correct physical malposition after seven, ten days, as Anneli uh, has just told, are liable to do more damage than the good to the physis. So, high risk of iatrogenic damage. So, no reduction after uh, two weeks. This is a trauma uh, presented in the emergency room after two weeks of the post trauma. Don't touch nothing, just only to immobilize. And you can see after three months, there is no, no completely remodeling and no problem for the physis. Low risk is due to, uh, the, for the distal radius, because of the, there is a, a smooth a uniplanar physis and 45% the old physical injuries, but fortunately only 12% of gross disturbances in this site. The distal radius do not insert the lateral Kishner Y due to the Rambier zone has uh, an uh, cited before me. And there is a medium risk of uh, to carry on of the uh, some problems for uh, for the physis. Regarding the distal femur, there is an high risk because undulating multiplanar physis, only 1.4% of the physical injuries, but very high incidence of post-traumatic breaches and it's an emergency so you have to uh, to to run to the uh, or to, to fix the the fracture and to hope that this uh, high uh, percentage of a complication can be not present and the distal femur you can use a smooth pin they are pl placed across the physis either centrally or peripherally appear to share the same risk for physical bar formation. So avoid to repeat several transfixion during ping because in this way you, you could increase the, uh, the risk and the possibility to have a, a bone bridge formation. Type 3 and 4 requires an anatomical reduction with closed reduction uh, or open reduction and internal fixation, like in this case of the, the type 4 of the distal part of the femur. For the proximal tibia and tibial tubercle, there is a medium risk of uh, to develop this kind of a complication because uh, there are very rare injuries, less than 1%. And proximal tibial physis closed distally towards to the tubercle apophysis. So the proximal tibial physis starts closure posterior medially and then proceed anterior laterally. So the, the physis of the tibial tubercle is closing in proximal to distal direction. That's the reason why this is a patient who had this kind of fracture, and you can you can see even in the CT scan, and then it was, it was lost at follow-up, and after six years, it was presented in the clinics, and it is the outcome, because it was this kind of complication with the of the uh, of the knee. Regarding the distal tibia, it depends. I, I put it, it can be high risk, medium, or low risk. And because the three plane hanker fracture are complex fractures that involve the epiphysis, physis, and posterior metaphysis of the distal part of the tibia, represent 5 to 10% of pediatric interarticular ankle injuries. So risk is strictly connected to, to at the H. And then you remind, uh, remind the clumps bump that is the point of the start of the ossification with the distal part of the physis. Is the triplane fracture? Everybody knows there is a typical age is between 12 and 50 years, and the boys a little bit uh, older and the girls a little bit earlier, but never before 10 years of age and over 16 years of age. So there are uh, transitional fractures. Transitional means that uh, is due to the, the this time of the their life when the distal uh, tibial growth plate started just in the in the comes bump and then uh, the closure is first to medial and then to lateral and uh, this process takes uh, and around, on around uh, on average uh, 18 months. So the fracture occurred through great plate not yet fused. 
So the CT scan is very important because uh, around 30% of this uh, fracture classification based on plain radiographs after CT scan examination show a different pattern. And uh, for the distal P uh, tibia, it's very important to avoid uh, to uh, repeat the reduction maneuver in order to avoid to increase the risk of epiphysiodesis. So the, some uh, authors recommend to do, uh, do not more than three attempts of reduction after that to shift in an open reduction. Uh, the, the reason was uh, the, the, the no uh, successful or uh, closed reduction is due to the soft tissue interposition should be suspected. And then the trapped soft tissue is most commonly is a torn piece of metaphysial periosteum, which can carry a high rate of bridge formation, like in this case. And you can find exactly uh, here the, the, the thick periosteum interposed into the physis. So any fracture with a gap uh, over two millimeters uh, and uh, an estimated residual growth of two years or more has been to operate. And uh, now, uh, recently, last year, GBJS uh, uh, paper was uh, fixed the, the lower limit in 2.5 millimeters. So in conclusion, injuries to the growth plate make an approximately one third of skeletal trauma in children and problems after injury are uncommon when treated well, fortunately. And if reduction is not anatomic, there will be epiphyseal to metaphyseal bone contact, which with healing may form a bark across the physis. So obviously, if much of the germinal layer is disturbed, there is a change for growth high risk. So the risk factor of bridge formation is due to the severity of injury and displacement, convenution, loss of segment, germinal and proliferative zone. The growth potential, younger are more exposed than the, 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 the more older child. And anatomic side is uh, one thing to, to recall for the contour of the physis and the growth plate. And the type of fracture, of course, because longitudinal fracture with transfusial vascularity have a, a different pattern with uh, rather than the transfer fracture involved in germinal and proliferative zone. They are more dangerous. And so the surgeon decision is an urgent reduction. Do not manipulate too many times. Do not violate vices upset for some transitional fracture. Adequate K wire size, the site introduction of the K wires, and the boy to transfix several times the physis, and then to restore the joint surface as much as possible. And so after that, to install a, a, a strict follow-up program. In summary, fortunately, as Wenger told, the majority of growth plate injuries involve little risk of growth disturbance. In few, simply surgical intervention can make a great deal of difference to the outcome of the injury and happily the number of children who have irretrievable damage is very small. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So after that I have uh, to uh, thank you for uh, uh, the possibility uh, to bring my experience and I wanted to uh, uh, to give the microphone to our treasurer, Pierre uh, Journeau from NC. And just only two way to disconnect. L'avevo fatto? Dimmi. Non, mi sen non ti sento. Good morning, uh, uh, good morning. Well, good afternoon, dear colleagues, and uh, thank you to Aneli and uh, Zecchio for a very nice talk. And uh, actually, the problem is uh, to assess um, the, the bone bridge after injuries or after, uh, do you see my screen or not? No, unfortunately no. not. No. 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 Why? I 
I get so I and now yes, no, yes, okay. Yes. Yes. okay right thank you and uh, the problem after uh, physical injuries and uh, bone bridge is to assess the bone bridge in order to uh, uh, treat this bone bridge and the radiological analysis is absolutely uh, needs to be very precise and accurate and uh, the first time is to follow up regular follow up after physical injuries during at least one year or more because we know that uh, during the first year we we can see uh, some uh, little bone bridge uh, during a few months and uh, sometimes this bone bridge uh, spontaneously break or not and uh, in this case it's very important to to follow only by x-rays uh, to detect the transitory uh, bone bridge but before that if you uh, see the x-ray on the distal tibia uh, Salter 2, you can analyze the, the corner because in this case you have a very severe impaction of the corner into the growth plate. And in this case, you know that during your follow up, you will, uh, you will see uh, the uh, bone bridge and the information to the parents is very important to uh, assess and to explain before the bone bridge, the follow-up, and why. When you have a bone bridge, you have five questions, five questions to radiologists. The first one, of course, uh, before treatment, is the location and size of the bone bridge. But to have uh, accurate and uh, a good treatment, the remaining physis in, in the quality of the physis is very important to assess before treatment because if you have a poor remaining physis you will uh, the risk is to get a poor results after surgery if you decide to operate the child, the child you need to have a very accurate planning and the pre op planning is very important to define the surgical approach the size of the window and the hole and to uh, perform uh, very uh, good resections of the of the bar. But after surgery, you have a risk of recurrence of uh, a bar, and uh, you need to follow the, your children before surgery. And of course, after surgery, after after injury, it's very important to follow the the physis and the, uh, to detect the growth disturbances. What are our tools and the radiological uh, tools? You have the CT scan. The CT scan is easy to get, of course, but it's not very useful because you can see only the size and location of the bridge, but uh, you have a large irradiation uh, of the children. You have uh, no information of the vascularization and the residual physis. And sometimes if you compare the CT scan here and the MRI, you cannot to be sure then to see the fibrous physical bar because before bone bridge, you have at the beginning a fibrous bar and it's very important to assess all the size of the bar, fibrous and bone bar. For that, in the literature and uh, your, during your current practice, the MRI is the gold standard tool to allowing all the assessments of the bone bridge. The size, location, you can uh, have a preoperative planning using the 3D reconstruction. And you have also the quality, the assessments of the quality of the physis, especially uh, on uh, the vascularization. And for that, you, you, you need to know the, the sequences of the MRI because if you, if you say or if you ask to the radiologist, uh, do an do a MRI, the radiologist will do an MRI, a standard MRI without very precise sequences. And you need to know each sequences for each assessment. 
For the bomb bridge assessment, your question is the size, the location, and also the shape. Because if you have a very precise shape, you will prepare your surgery with a very precise resection. And for that, the best sequence is a T2 fat sat to see the bone bridge and also the fibrous part in this, uh, in this uh, bone bridge. Concerning the shape and the location, you can use a 3D reconstruction. The T1 is not really useful because it's like a CT scan or like an X-ray. And the best uh, sequence is the, the eco gradient sequence using uh, because we can see the cartilage, the bone bridge bar here, and the fibrous bar here. And uh, with a 3D reconstruction, you can see all the hole and all the exact size and location in the physis, allowing a very precise preoperative planning. A real question is the quality of the remaining physis because you can you know that if you have a, a poor quality of the physis, your result will be poor. And for that, we are use the angiography and dynamic angiography MRI to see the quality of the vascularization of the physis uh, using the intra uh, intravenous injection. In this curve, you can see the artery curve in green. It's a, like a peak after injection and progressive decrease of the uh, contrast product in the artery. And in this curve, it's a, like a normal physis after injection, and it's a, like a curve for the normal uh, physis uh, curve. If you want to assess the quality of the physis and the quality of vascularization, you can use the angiography MRI. And in this example, you can see the artery in the green curve, the normal physis here, and the remaining physis in the uh, left part. It's a, it is an eco gradient MRI with a very, very thin physis, very few normal parts explaining a poor vascularization of the physis. Probably in these examples, if you, is, you perform the large resection of these parts, the result will be poor due to a poor quality of the running physis. Concerning the prognosis after bar resection, you have three problems. The first problem is an incomplete bar resection during surgery. For that, you need to perform a large window. And uh, Melida Winbrook and Pelascon will describe in the next talk all the surgical procedure and treatments. And uh, you can have a, also the early teaser after resection because you have a, a mechanism, a new mechanism of a new bar. And the risk is, is to get a new bar only due to a fibrous uh, teaser after surgery. The other problem uh, in, the, in the surgery is a graft migration. If you use a fat graft or cement, or the poor residual physis, as you can see in the previous uh, slide. For that, uh, Carol Asler from uh, uh, oh, I don't remember the name of the city in the Switzerland, uh, proposed a standardized protocol for the follow-up using a, a very early post-operative MRI during the I mean, one month after surgery and a new MRI using the same sequences to assess the results of the surgery after bar resection. And the second problem is the prognosis after physical injuries, as you can see uh, during the previous talk. The problem is to assess the gross uh, disturbances uh, with the, 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 the X-ray. And some paper in the literature propose to follow 
the uh, probable uh, bone bridge with the early uh, post-op injury MRI after three months because during the, the two first months you have a small, very small bone bridge. For that, after three months, some paper proposed to uh, to, to to perform uh, post-injury MRI to detect the early formation of uh, the brain bridge. In summary, we have uh, some uh, uh, home messages. The first one is to have an accurate analysis of initial injury and especially the initial X-ray, because sometimes if you have a, a crush or in of the metaphysis in the gross plates, you can imagine to have a bone bridge after a few months. The second one is to check the early signs of growth disturbances during your follow-up and you need to follow your child every three or four months with a very precise x-ray to detect the growth disturbance and to perform MRI if you have a doubt. If you can start a bone bridge uh, let's choose the best sequences of MRI in order to assess the bone bridge, the vascularization, and the shape of the bone bridge to prepare the best treatment. And after surgery, if you want to win and to get a good result, you need to follow with a precise MRI, precise X-ray the results after the bar resection. I thank you for your attention and I give the, micro, the microphone to the next speaker to explain the treatments and we will uh, open discussion at the end of the old talks. Thank you so much. Hello. Is it okay? Can you hear me and see the presentation? Yes, Pierre. Yes, Pierre. We see you. Okay. Um, good evening. And uh, so uh, now we are facing with uh, Bonnie Bar, uh, which is responsible of growth disturbances. And the problem is how to treat this bone bridge. You know that the bone bridge is a scar, and uh, previous speaker explained that this is a traumatic scar, which means that except the bridge, the rest of the physis may grow normally. And etiologies are fractures, bone tumors, surgical aggression. The advantage is that this evolution can be predictable. But the bone bridge can also be a disease. Uh, I would say that the rest of the physis perhaps may be abnormal and you may face cases with uh, osteoarticular infections, post rare disorders, and in these cases evolution is not predictable and so recurrence is frequent. So when you have to treat a bony bar, you have two options. The first one is to complete the bony bridge to avoid an increase of the deformity and then to correct the bone deformity, the discrepancy, as uh, Melinda will uh, explain to you. Look at this uh, example, for instance. But we know that there are advantages, but also disadvantages, heavy procedures and complications. So the option two we are going to discuss is to destroy the bridge and to hope a recovery of a normal growth of the physis. Of course, it's an elegant method, only one or two procedures, but these advantages are the possibility of a recurrence, and then you go back to the option, option one. What are the principles of a day's epiphysiodesis? First, you have to remove the bone bridge. So you should know exactly where it is, and Pierre Jonot explained brilliantly the mapping, and you have to decide on your surgical approach to avoid to destroy more. That means to destroy the normal part of the physis. Second, 
you have to replace the to replace the defect by either a normal physis, which would be the ideal, and uh, free vascularized transfer has been performed, but there are no large series in the literature, or sometimes just cartilage culture, or you prefer an inert substance. And what is the goal of this inert substance? And there are two totally different concepts. One concept is to allow the repair of the normal physis taking place of the inert substance, or, which is totally different, to allow the normal growth of the rest of the physis around the inert substance. When you look at the history, Langeskrull for Finland present this first paper that was uh, Bonibor of the femur in a child 10 year old, and he performed just an astotomy, and after a couple of years, he had a normal growth. Probably that was the hyperstimulation, the physis, but also a small bony bar. And of course, it's uh, well known that spontaneous breakage exists, but we are not in this case. In the same group of the uh, Finland team, Osterman showed a beautiful uh, experimental work with uh, this graft of uh, cartilage at the place of the lateral bony bar. And you see that after a couple of uh, months, you have a growth and a beautiful physis at the place of the bony bar. So the reparation of lateral bone bridge is possible. And then a good paper from Langut School, in this case of epiphysiodesis, that was a lateral deviation, a lateral bridge, direct approach, resection of the bar, fat tissue, and you see the correction, but the follow-up is only two years. Now we have three questions. How to resect a central bone bridge? Because in the Lange skull, it was a lateral bridge. What kind of inert substance are you going to use? And in the literature, you see different pads, elastic, cranioplast, cartilage, cement. And where to fix the inner plug? Is it into the metaphysis or into the epiphysis? Inert substance, I would say that many things works. Pad, silicone, cartilage, cement. Personally, I would prefer cement. You will understand why. And about cartilage, again, we see more experimental studies that are really clinical series. Here again, a recent paper uh, from uh, uh, Osaka, I guess. Uh, and you see uh, rabbits with cartilage, bone bridge. In the control, you have a deformity from 90 to 59 degrees with an epiphysiodesis, and in the cartilage treatment graph, 90 to 80 degrees. Of course, this is better than the group of control, but there is a 10 degrees deformity, which is not really excellent, you would admit with me. So it works, but series are experimental, as I mentioned. Celastic works too. This is a rare Salter 5 type of the distal radius in a boy six years of age, central epiphysiodesis, resection, silastic, and you see the result after uh, nine years. But it concerns the upper limb, which is a little bit different than lower limb. So how to reach a paracentral or a central bone bridge? You make a hole into the metaphysial wall, and uh, like Peterson from the Mayo Clinic has described, you reach the central brace, you remove it with a curette or a drill, whatever, and then you put your inner substance. But I may admit that it's quite difficult to be sure that you see the cartilage of the physis all around your hole. So you can use the CRM, you can use a CD and navigation. And recently, sorry, this case is from Osaka, uh, you see uh, the use of some 3D printing tools to reach the bony bridge area. And then with an endoscope, they check that all around the hole, they are able to see the white cartilage and to give the proof that the resection is complete. Another method was described by Gérard Molini from Marseille was to use the distraction principle of the Elizarov technique. First stage, you put a fixator in the epiphysis and the diaphysis. 
then one millimeter per day you distract, like a lengthening, and at one moment you have a sudden break, which it's painful. Uh, usually it's around T7, and then the distraction allows you to see perfectly the bridge, and at that moment, in the second stage, you are able to remove the bridge, you make a hole, and then in the place of the hole, you make a piece of cement, and here you see that the block of cement is conic, with a wider part in the metaphysis. And you have the result some years later, which grows, which is considered like normal. But if you look to the recent experience, not the recent, but the recent paper of the Peterson's experience, uh, 48 patients, all operating by Dr. Peterson himself, uh, evaluation at skeletal maturity, very nice, 29% of good results with only one bar stage procedure, but 71% needed other procedure, including bone lengthening. So that means that at the end, the results are correct, but they need option two and option one, as I said before. And the question now is the migration of the metaphysical plug. There is a French study with only 19 cases, five good results, one failure with no epiphysiolysis, but 13 partial results, which means that there is an initial activity, but at one moment, some years later, you have a premature growth arrest due to a recurrence of the epiphysiolysis. And if you look at this case, uh, which is resection near the top, very nice, plug cement, good evolution but look at that five years later there is a nice growth but honestly there is a recurrence of uh, the bridge and probably this patient will need a second procedure so this should not be considered as a failure of the treatment but we should be prudent and say to our patient we never know what will happen during the remaining growth and then this is very interesting to go this this new concept described by Jean-Luc Jouve, sorry, working in Marseille with Gérard Bonini. And he did this uh, uh, experimental study in rabbits. In a group A, you have a, just a hole into the physis and you see it's obvious an epiphysiodesis. And in the group B, he put a silicon cylinder at the place of the hole fixed into the metaphysial part and in the group C fixed into the epiphysial part. And you see the result when there is no plot epiphysial disease, the difference between right and left side who was used as control is 12 millimeters. In the group B with the metaphysial fixation, there is a growth, but the difference is 9.90 uh, millimeters and in the epiphysial groups you see that the difference is very very low that means that the concept here is just to allow the growth of the physis around the cylinder and let the cylinder totally inert sliding along uh, this uh, physis so there is here an example which is totally different that was uh, an evril small uh, bone cyst but you see that is across the physis so you may imagine after diagnosis and so that if you graft the, the, the lesion, it will be automatically an epiphysiodesis. So my decision was to put this plug and cement fixed into the epiphysis. And you see after one year, the, uh, bone, the union, the, 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 the grafting of the normal uh, area, okay. But you see that the growth is quite correct. And after six years, you see on the right that uh, there is no discrepancy, still the plug of cement at the level of uh, the distal place, and uh, may imagine a normal growth around. And I will conclude uh, to complete uh, beautiful Antonio's presentation, because the question is, can we sometimes predict or prevent an epiphysiodesis? You are almost sure that in this case uh, of uh, Solter 4 type of the medial myleolus, the high risk of epiphysial disease, even if you have a perfect reduction because that was a crush. And this comes also from Toulouse and from Marseille. And these guys decided to put a plug of cement into the epiphysis. And you see the beautiful growth line after two years, 
and the normal growth after four years, like you can see uh, on the right. So the question is indication for this epiphysial disease. There is alternative to what is going to say Melinda. And we have to compare one side with the other side. But indication of this epiphysial disease depends on the rate of predictive success, of course. First, analyze the size of the bridge. It should be not too big. Second, the position of the bridge. It's uh, easier laterally uh, than central because the quality of the resection, and this is very important, the quality of your resection. If you are not sure to remove all the bridge and only the bridge, don't do it. Or, of course, you need enough growth. 10, 11 years could be a limit. And remember the etiology, a traumatic etiology is better than some dysplasia or uh, sequela of infectious uh, disease. So my take home message is first, have an excellent mapping and I would add vascularization of the feces as mentioned by Pierre Journaud. The possibility to resect your bone, choose your inner plate fixation into the epiphysis and it's why the cement is probably the best uh, element. And of course, a last question is, do you associate during the des epiphysial disease surgical procedure other correction like a lengthening or an osteotomy. I think that when it's a des epiphysial disease alone, don't do it. Of course, if you use a polynese procedure with an external fixator, you can imagine to take the opportunity of the X fix to correct a little bit an angulation and to add some uh, centimeters of lengthening. Thank you very, very much. And I gave the microphone to uh, Melinda. Let's see, I'll try to open, yeah, this is it, and see if this works. I just, don't think I just, want to no. inform, I just want to inform the audience, maybe you can send us some question you have, because it's open for question and we will answer after the discussion. Sorry, Melinda, that I interrupt you, but up to now no. we have no question. Okay. That's why I <laughs> the audience to, to ask us some questions. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, I can't open completely my PowerPoint presentation, otherwise I'll have a white screen, uh, I see. So I'll just uh, do it uh, this way. So thank you very much uh, for um, all for joining this webinar, and I'm very happy to be the last presenter. And hopefully uh, there will be a lot of questions uh, also from this uh, talk. I'm Melinda Wittrock, I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon in the Pediatric Orthopedic Center of Amsterdam and also Utrecht. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, after the growth plate injury. And um, let me find it. Yeah, uh, growth plate injuries, as we just heard uh, before, can be because of trauma, but also because of infection of other diseases. So what happens uh, after growth plate injury? It's one, either the growth plate remains intact and can also, if there's a deformity, um, correct the, these deformity in due course. Or the growth plate forms a bony bar, if we, if we just heard, or partial closure, and then you get growth deformity and also leg length discrepancy or the growth plate closes completely and um, you will have leg length discrepancy only. So also, um, Pierre Juno uh, also mentioned, we have to um, follow up these patients with a growth plate injury because you can have these problems and you can have deformities or leg length difference. So it's a very important. Um, now I'll show you um uh, uh, a patient who where the growth plate remains intact and also in due course uh, the um, deformity uh, was corrected by itself this is a 10 year old girl with a um, distal radial fracture 
in our center was it uh, treated with the uh, plaster and a and e and it was nicely corrected but unfortunately the plaster was not very well adjusted and of course you understand that if the plaster is not well adjusted you can have a um a re um deformity in the plaster uh, of this fracture so this what is happened was happened after four weeks so you see already a bit of uh, um, callus formation so we decided to leave it and explain of course to the parents that uh, the chance was very big that the, um, that the deformity will grow uh, normally and then in eight months time uh, you can see that clinically the deformity was completely uh, corrected and uh, also almost radiologically corrected. So this is in case of an intact growth plate. Um, but if uh, there's no intact growth plate and you get an actual deformity uh, or leg length difference, what can we do? What kind of um, things we can do? Of course, you can try to remove the bony bridge. Um, but if that's not possible or you were not able to do it, um, you ha always have your growth modulation by hemiepiphysiodesis you can try. You can shorten the longer bone or lengthen the short bone and you have your correction osteotomies. And sometimes you have to plan a patient and you can't do everything in one go. So you have to explain patient and parents that it's, it's a, a combination over time and you need some more interventions over time uh, to get the, the legs straight. And yeah, the aim is equal alignment and equal leg length, almost equal leg length. So here you can see a boy um, who had valgus deformity and uh, the growth medulation if the, the uh, the growth plate uh, is, is still normal, is not uh, damaged, you can do by hemiepiphysiodesis, you get a very nice alignment. So that's an easy way of uh, do something about uh, deformity. So uh, if you have a leg length difference uh, only, uh, you can uh, shorten the longer bone. And this is a, a girl 13 and a half years old who had already before um, an epiphysiodesis of the distal femur and hemiepiphysiodesis on the both sides of the proximal tibia. I don't know why this was chosen for, um, but I saw the child when she was like this. And she was okay with just shortening the femur, which was still, uh, this was by the way, uh, because of a femoral fracture. And that's why it was um, uh, too long. So we shortened the longer femur by um, intramedullary saw and uh, it healed all well and she was uh, happy with this. So this is a, a way of getting equal leg length. Um, but you can also lengthen the shorter bone with this traction callus. And you can either use an intramedullary nail or an external frame. And uh, this is a 17 year old girl who had also um, a problem with earlier closure of the proximal tibia. Um, and we lengthened it with the um, intermedullary nail and distraction callus. And she was happy afterwards uh, with uh, this uh, distraction. And we always explain to, parents, to patients and parents as well that uh, you can choose by either lengthening or shortening. And um, sometimes they just decide what length they are and what they want to. So you can also do the lengthening with um, an hexapod. And uh, most of the time do that if you have a deformity as well. So this was a girl of uh, 16 years uh, old and uh, we lengthened her and uh, we got rid of the deformity. The last time I saw her was um, uh, just before Corona, and I uh, told and I said in my uh, outpatient clinic notes uh, that I should have a long length um, X-ray of her, but uh, unfortunately she didn't come back yet, so I have to ask for her to come back again. This girl, um, because we we lengthened quite a bit, she uh, developed uh, um, equinus. So when we removed this uh, frame, we also had to do the lengthening of the triceps myotenotomy, and that, that went really well. 
So this is a possibility to also to lengthen and, and correct the deformity immediately. And uh, this is almost the uh, same um, patient as we saw before, I think from Antonio uh, in, the, in Italy, but it's not the same. This is a Dutch uh, boy of 17 years old and he had a trauma with football and he, uh, they did an x-ray, they didn't find anything. So probably they, this probably has had to be a, um, a partial growth damage of the uh, tuberosis tibia. And I saw him first when he had this deformity. They thought first he had a, a posterior, um, um, uh, how do you say it, a posterior cruciate ligament injury. But when we saw the X-ray and there was also an MRI taken, uh, it uh, was only this partial closure of the uh, anterior part of the proximal tibia. So we did a um, acute correction and uh, an open wedge. So he had, uh, uh, he still had a little bit of leg length difference uh, afterwards, but uh, he was uh, fine with it and uh, uh, he was happy like this. So he did not have any hyperextension anymore, just like here, 20 degrees. So um, some th these are patients all had one correction and, um, and they were fine. But uh, now I, I will show a patient which uh, might need uh, some discussion afterwards. It's a girl we, um, I saw for the first time when she was three years of age. And um, it was unclear why she had a bar. Probably might have been an infection or trauma, we don't know. And um, we thought it was a quite big bar uh, for maybe at least one third. So we discussed that at that time with the parents. Um, um, when I saw her a year or half a year later um, that um, the tibia was growing and uh, the various deformity she had already seemed to be the same. So every year we followed her up and uh, the parents uh, decided together with the team um, that we just followed up and see uh, if the tibia would grow and uh, if the varus would stay the same, that we would need eventually uh, more uh, correction, at least for the leg length difference and also for the varus deformity. Um, but it's a very important again to discuss this with the patients and with the with the patient and the parents that they know that they are not finished and it's a long um, and a, a, lot, a lot more steps to get to the aim of a, a nice straight uh, leg length and um, and normal alignment. So at 11 years old, she came back again and she said that she had some complaints of the knee. So uh, we decided to uh, put an eight plate uh, on the lateral uh, proximal tibia um, and also an epiphysis of the proximal fibula because that was already a little bit uh, longer than uh, on the other side. And um, the first instance, it, it seemed to grow, but of course, when the child is very young and, and grows hard, the bar can still grow along. Um, but um, when you stop the growth on the lateral side, uh, and I already discussed it as well, that was a possibility, the growth plate stopped and it didn't enough, uh, not enough correction. So we removed the A plate when she was 12 years old and we decided uh, to, um, we planned a new operation. And because the various deformity was a bit more, we decided to do first a, a correction osteotomy of the tibia and let it heal. And uh, we had also a felgus of the distal femur. Uh, so we had to put a eight plate on the medial uh, distal side of the femur. And uh, eventually in a later stage, we wanted to lengthen the leg. Um, so, here you can see the um, osteotomy, correction osteotomy, and uh, the uh, A-plate in the distal femur. And you see that the, um, it looked quite straight, but that's because we still had a bit of velcros in the distal femur, of in the femur, and um, the varus was not completely corrected, uh, uh, about five degrees, uh, we left about five degrees. So we also, again, discussed it with the parents that 
this was uh, not a problem because we could correct it in the later stage when we would lengthen the leg. So this all healed and went well. Um, so eventually we still had a bit of five degrees uh, deformity in the, ver in, um, in the uh, tibia and the femur was okay. So now we planned her for the last procedure and uh, for the lengthening and for the um, um, small varus correction. So you can see it here uh, with the uh, intramedullary nail. Uh, we corrected it and, um, and we lengthened it for another three, three and a half centimeters. And here you see eventually um, straight leg length and uh, yeah, almost uh, equal uh, leg length. She didn't want to have a few centimeters uh, more and she was happy with this. Um, so you, this is a discussion, maybe we can discuss it later. Should we have, should we done a visual um, bony bar removal and could we have uh, prevented all the operations now? Or like we already heard by Pierre Lascombe, 70% of the patients need anyway uh, leg length um, uh, after and the end of the growth. Um, so my take home message, after fracture involving the growth plate, uh, follow up the patients for at least one year. Explain that if you have to do a correction of a bony bar and of growth plate injury, that it might be uh, some more um, operations in one go and maybe some more operations during their life and aim eventually for equal alignment and almost equal leg length. Thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we can have a nice discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melinda. And thank you to all the speaker for the quality, the high quality of uh, their talks. And we have about uh, 10 or 12 minutes for discussion. And I propose to start each by each uh, talk. Um, so we have uh, I have no no question for Anelit for this moment, but um, probably in a few minutes. Um, to Tony, we have uh, two questions. Um, Tony, the the first question is. Uh, uh, what what is uh, your opinion about uh, periosteum incision around the physis when you perform uh, ORIF in case of fracture to avoid a teether uh, around the physis? A mute. Okay. Mute. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the my, probably I don't know if it was a misunderstanding when I usually don't uh, uh, perform any incision of the of the of the periosteum when you perform an open reduction. It just only because I, in that case was because this was interposition of the periosteum into the into the to the phases due to the fracture so i i had to open in order to reduce and then i recognized there was there as that specimen and so I, I i took the pictures but i usually don't don't touch that's it just only to underline this is very important when you are not be able to obtain a good reduction of the fracture maybe is due to the interposition of the of the of the periosteum. That's the reason why you are not be able to reduce the fracture or to maintain the good reduction. That's the reason why at that point you have to shift and to avoid the to re uh, repetition of the maneuver to reduction and to uh, shift to the open reduction. And obviously, uh, almost of the cases you can find this specimen and you can find the, the periosteum inside to the to the physis. So then you have to really is sometimes it's pretty difficult to to retrieve this piece of very torn periosteum and, and put inside and that's you can uh, a good uh, reduction and, and that's it but i otherwise i don't touch the the periosteum because it's very useful to have a good periosteum inside the fracture inside the uh, around okay thank you thank you Tony. 
Another question concerning the pathophysiology of uh, physis in case of using uh, external fixator. And um, just uh, to understand, if you use external fixator in case of fracture, the, the external fixator will, uh, will bridge the physis due to the, the kind of fracture. Do you use a, a smooth distraction to prevent the bone bridge? The question is for who? For you and for Anneli, due, due to the pathophysiology of bone bridge, because uh, some uh, some uh, uh, some auditor wants to to have some tricks using X fix in case of a very severe fracture uh, involving uh, epiphyseal and metaphyseal fracture, and sometimes we need to put an X fix crossing the physis. And uh, in this case, do you use a smooth distraction before, in case of? I have to say, I, I really uh, very, uh, very rarely use the, the, the external fixator for the, this kind of fracture, just only for the open fraction. It's very important, uh, like uh, goes to low three or four, but anyway, not, not really uh, 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 routinely use of the this kind of uh, fry and then when i use the just only the the same uh, uh procedure i mean it just only to reduce the 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 Pfizer fracture and then to maintain the reduction and then the, the same uh, uh, principle if you are not be able to reduce or to maintain it because of something wrong inside the, to the Pfizer so you have to to have a courage or, or whatever in order to be, to be, be sure there is no inside the, the Pfizer in the uh, some torn uh, periosteum but there is no really differences. I mean, I, I don't use it to distract before because of the, the risk to have a, a length length discrepancy or to increase the, the length of the bone is too high in this in this kind of fracture. Okay, and Anneli? Yes, according to your knowledge, uh, if, uh, according to the pathophysiology of bone bridge, do you imagine to distract a little yeah. bit uh, there if you some, need to, to use there's it? Some you make this in a, in a small small motion and you get a lengthening. It's not like that you just preserve any physis, but there's no literature where you have a bar where you resect and then do a epiphyseal lysis with a fixed X. And in clinical routine, I completely agree with Tony, you, you use it for, for severe damaged extremities where you, in most cases, in my, in my experience, we do an epiphysiodesis because often the physis is completely traumatically injured. And um, so I can't really answer it because there are not too many research publications on this topic. And I think the danger is to destroy it if you make the destruction too fast. You know, you can also destroy the physis. And if you do it, slowly then you have always a stimulation this is a stimulation for the physis you get a leg, leg length discrepancy so i think um, it's it's not really something which is routinely used as we have seen it's it's a bar which we sect and then you use it i am not sure because i don't know the long-term outcome of this procedure i don't know sorry this okay thank you do you have do you have some more data? No. No. To my knowledge, no. But, but this brings no, me to a question. If we compare, if we compare uh, bone lengthening um, and uh, the pathophysiology of physis, uh, in bone lengthening, uh, when we perform a multifocal and multisegmental bone lengthening, Good. the literature recommends to distract a little bit the joints and the physis to avoid the compression of the physis and, and the joint and according to the different topic, you know, no compression on the physis because this makes opposite the compression should be avoided so this is for clear but this brings me to a question from tanya kraus she said to maybe pierre or antonio she asked the following question when you do decide to remove the whole physis or the bridge and close the physis, what is the amount of, of, of bar in the MRI? Also, it's a question to, to Pierre. What is the amount of bar 
in the physis when you decided, okay, there might be not a good successful uh, resection, I complete the physis and then do a, a secondary lengthening. What is what is your opinion? Opinion? How many percent of bar you would <laughs> accept, and which one you would not accept? I think it's a, it's a, it's the question because it's not clear. And um, what I would expect is uh, some uh, series uh, which would be able to give us a kind of curve regarding a percentage and the age of the child. It's clear that if you have 20% of bar at age 5, 6, 8, do it. If you have 20% at age 13 in a boy, I'm not sure that it's very uh, nice. Now, if you have more than 50% at age five, try. Why not? Uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure of the success. Yeah. So it's because in, in research, always said 50%, but I think it's in research, and I think you have to make it age dependent. And if it's a very young child, you have to try it. I mean, closer, close the phases in a five year old, it's not really and, and likely. I, yeah, and probably what is very important more than the percentage is the, the vascularization, as mentioned by Pierre. Uh, because yeah. you, you saw an MRI with a very thin thesis, which could be on only AP view, probably 70%. We don't know the circular percentage. But anyway, when you see this, you are sure that the thesis, which is supposed to be a normal thesis, in fact, it is not a normal. Because what is very important is not the bar you remove, it's the potential of growth of the remaining physics. I have oh, one question. I just take them of the audience because it's also a question which is quite interesting. It's a little bit also my question. You say, Pierre, that you use inert material and here's a question um, which says why. And if you take cement, which kind of cement you use, and why you decide to take cement? Uh, you need to put something in the hole, because if you don't put an inert substance, automatically the hematoma will uh, transform in what? In a bone bar. So uh, it's uh, <laughs> evident that you need to put something. Uh, fat is not so bad. Uh, the problem is fat is that you can then manage a conic form and you cannot fix it probably uh, as you wish. Of course, cement uh, seems to be something uh, we are not allowed to use in a, in a child because the cement is here forever. Uh, and in addition, you add a, a key wire or a screw to, to, to secure the position of this plug. Uh, but honestly, I think that cement is not so, so bad because you, you can model it exactly as you want in the shape you wish, uh, you fix it into the epiphysis if you decide the epiphysis, and uh, this is nice. And don't don't be afraid; there is no risk that the cement create a new bar, because of course you could say the cement will fuse the both part, but it's not true. Mm -hmm. What what I'm surprised when I look at that is the the series about cartilage because honestly you say okay we have to do a, a graft of cartilage there are some experimental studies with a, a mesenchymatous cells culture of joint cartilage and so and so but the clinical uh, evaluation are, are rare and not so 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 nice today but of course it's the future but you know in the past when everybody started to do free vascularized transfer of anything uh, a lot of surgeons started with the iliac crest with the vascularization, but they stopped. So, no, vascularity uh, is not good. Vascularity is not good. I enough. mean, I'm not agreeing if it's on the lateral side, if it's a, not, it's a central bar, then it's much more difficult. And I agree completely with you. You have to put something in the hole which really fits in the hole, because if not, there's always material which also induce that the vascularity is coming but if it's laterally i think we have also good results with fat or cartilage from the ribs i mean it is always you know there is easier to put in because you don't have to be so exact it's not like a steam that's going yeah you had another question 
Yeah, um, I saw I saw a very interesting question from uh, Hans Peter Huber from Switzerland about mm -hmm. the quality of vascularity of the physis after bar resection. The question is: after bar resection, is the vascularization uh, will be better or not? A very difficult question because uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, very difficult. I only question. know that after bar resection you can have. There are two options. One option is that if you have a bar, the agent cartilage goes down and decrease, degenerate, you know, which means diminishing in vascularization. So opposite, if you resect the bar, this cartilage seems to, to recover, to, to be active. And so what you also could figure out that you have a stimulation of the physis if the bar is resected. But the vascularity, I did not make any injection study, so I can't say if really it's the vascularity. But um, the stimulation took part, for sure. <laughs> Pierre. But, but this is a good question, and it would be very interesting. Uh, first, uh, you mentioned, uh, Anneli, the uh, overgrowth. So, Pierre, do you have a proof of hypervascularization of overgrowth? No, but you should do it. <laughs> Second, imagine you make your bone knee bar resection, and because you create a kind of uh, like osteotomy, something, you may imagine an hypervascularization of the residual growth, which gives a kind of bump uh, for a new departure for this disease. And that would be very interesting to, yeah, to, to, to evaluate yeah. it. Yeah, you put a trauma, so with the trauma you have a stimulation for the prices. But it's also interesting that some paper also said if you have a bar, also the agent adjacent um, cartilage de degrade, uh, degenerate, and if you remove it, they popped up again. So you have also a local local change, and this is very interesting, but very yeah, not very good investigated or only a little bit investigated. But at least you can compare the studies because also this is a problem. How thick is your bar? You know, if you, uh, well, a good model is the red. This is shown in literature, but you can't compare often the papers because they use different holes, you know, they put to create a bar. So concerning the, the quality of the physis, it's a very difficult to assess because uh, the vascularization uh, is on seems to be good, but we haven't any uh, tools to assess the quality of cells and uh, the quality of chondrocyte and so and so. And uh, the assessment by vascularization is just uh, like good physis, but it's not a proof, real proof. Hmm. Here's another interesting question I want to discuss because I think the audience also has to get answers. And if you are a little bit younger, if you have to cross the physis, whatever the reason is, you have to remove the screw early enough. It's the same for the fixed X. If not, if the crowing is coming, you get you get a closure. So keep in mind if you cross across the physis, especially with titanium, we have now a new trial with magnesium. This this screw break and then you have the lengthening and it's going on with growing but with uh, titanium or a fixed x you get a compression on the physis because with the growing you compress the physis you have to remove early the screws i remove after at least 12 weeks and the fixed x very early after four to six weeks another question have we another question um the first one um it's we not have, so easy uh, yes we have some question about uh, the indication of uh, me epiphysiodesis or mm -hmm. closing the rest of physis in case of uh, lateral bar because the uh, question is uh, the risk uh, of over correction in case of any epiphysiodesis What's Melinda uh, yeah. or Claire? What, yeah. What's your of hemiepiphysis in case of lateral bar? Of uh, correction by hemiepiphysis won't happen. 
the only uh, thing you're worried about is what happened in my patient is that the growth plate will stop completely. Uh, yeah. Is that a is that the answer of the of the question? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah you have some yeah. suggestions. Uh, okay. Yeah. Antonio, go. No, I, I, yeah, I just told you to to say I have just used a couple of um, patients of mine and uh, this kind of uh, treatment uh, when uh, in the distal part of the femur was uh, started an epiphysiodesis and so on, they started to, to have uh, a deviation of the of the axis of the distal femur. So is is the patient is pretty uh, close to the physical maturity. So I try to to try to restore the axis first, and then we we can consider after the growth maturity the possibility to to lengthen the bone. And so I have to say there is a really uh, good outcome because the the virus deviation was corrected by the uh, epi uh, the eight plate the amy epiphysiodesis just only to restore the axis and then after that after the the skeletal maturity it, it can go to the more smoothly to the to have a length just a, a personal experience i have not a large uh study population it's just only a couple of, of patients but there is no so frequent uh, fracture fortunately and that was a, a pretty good uh outcome in, in this way just only to fix first the the axis in order to avoid the the, the axial deviation and after that you can consider to lengthen at the end of the maturity but it's very was patient close to the skeletal maturity melinda yeah, i, I think, think it's, it's always... a very good comment close to the maturity because if it's a very young one then you have to remove when the deviation is coming maybe back melinda yeah, I think, um, yeah, but the problem is if you're at the end of skeletal maturity, that the growth will be less and the, um, uh, the modulation will be less, of course. Um, and I think also you you always can try because it's a very easy uh, operation. And if it happen, if it, it works, it's easier than a, a correction osteotomy. So I think it's always worthwhile trying. Yeah, but when the child is very young, you you can correct it, but then you don't have a growing because you don't resect the bar, so you have to do something. So that's the same. Yeah, it's yeah, a challenge. Yeah. It's individual. You always have to de yeah. develop individual plans because there are so many factors in in, in what you have to to look for, like but, age. Uh, I'm sorry, Emily. I think that in a, in a webinar we are talking about bar, bony bar. And it's totally illogic to imagine that the MEP physiodesis on the other side could do something else That's than just said. than just stabilization. So that makes that you accept the deformity and you have one shot. Okay, it's a small surgery, blah blah blah, but it's a surgical procedure. One. Wow. So I think that what we can do is decide to correct to correct the bony bar, for instance. And if you have the proof that the bony bar progress and still a deformity, you may use an eight plate or something like that. But again, at that moment, you will have a short leg because the growth will be not enough. So you have to, to, to count the number of procedures you are going to do till the end of growth and make the choice. And sometimes, I'm sorry, but sometimes it's better to fuse completely the physis, make the osteotomy, straight bone, and then bone lengthening at the end of groups. It's two stage, three stage, big surgery, but it's not so big surgery today. And but that's honestly, what that's what I yeah. said. If you don't yeah. reset the bar, you have no, it's make no sense to make only hemiepiphysiodesis. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, no, I, I don't uh, see any other questions. Um, so I think uh, we can close uh, this uh, webinar and uh, I would like to thank uh, a lot all the speakers. Uh, thanks uh, Sunny for the organization in the back office. And of course, uh, Scott for, from orthopediatrics for the the financial support for the, all the webinar in this uh, special period of crisis and uh, i wish you a, a nice evening to to all and uh, i wish to to see you one more again uh, the next time for the next webinar and don't forget to consult and to see the 
ePost website to see all the program of, uh, of the webinar. Thank you so much. Nice evening and see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.